now. <laughs> Rob Pendergast is here with us this evening, and he's a passionate birder and nature enthusiast, hailing from Plover. His journey into birding sparked a fascination with citizen science, igniting his curiosity about the distribution and abundance of birds in Portage County. And you can also find Portage County birding reports, which um, Rob uh, runs and takes care of. Um, always something interesting on Facebook, yeah. Um, no, but, but other people do, yes. Always something interesting. This curiosity opened the door to Rob to delve into various aspects of local wildlife, winged and otherwise, in recent years. His focus has been on documenting the incredible Sorry, diversity of moths, with over 600 species documented to date. Today, Rob shares with us the fascinating life histories of moths, shedding light on the remarkable adaptations they've developed to thrive in their unique environments. He'll also guide us through the process of attracting, documenting, identifying, and contributing to citizen science projects of moths in Wisconsin. Let's give Rob a minute. So I'd like to start this with this. This is my first ever related presentation. So apologies in advance if there are anything that's still on the way. I, I try my best. Uh, but the main purpose of this is to kind of get a general overview of mothing, moth watching, attracting moths, uh, documenting the observations. Uh, and moths do kind of get a bad rap based on the expected tendencies of a true species. Moths and not to be voice again, so hopefully to this helps with that. Hello. Um, born and raised in the Stevens Point area, um, raised on nature. I was that kid always flipping logs in the backyard to see centipedes and stuff. Uh, I had a very mild obsession with whales when I was very young, which transitioned to dinosaurs. Then when I was 10, I was at a local bookstore, and my dad told me I should get one book. I picked up the Smithsonian Field Guide for Birds of North America. <laughs> Worked me that day, I guess, and kind of slowly got me into birding. Um, when I was 13 or 14, my uncle took me out birding and I was a bird, which I figured was a lot of polka decks. <laughs> Pokemon, I was a childhood dream of mine. It's only way this in real life. Uh, and it's been snowballing since then. And it's sort of an excellent gateway to other facets of the natural world. So, moths, with the low barrier of entry, are being relatively cheap. Uh, and really, all you have to do is put the lights on and come to the start. I've been documenting moths for two and a half years now. So, by no means am I an expert on them. Uh, moths actually tend to be very esoteric, kind of constantly learning about them. Uh, very similar to birds, uh, and probably most similar to adults. I think everybody knows the birds to identify adults. So projects I've been involved in, I'm currently the eBird reviewer for Portage for Share in Otaka County. Uh, if you're not on eBird, highly recommend it. It is a dynamic tool. Lots of valuable information and data you submit to there. Goes to scientific publications, conservation efforts. Um, we have the most accurate range maps of any platform. Um, and if anyone's interested, I can do talk about that next year. <laughs> also, lead field trips for the Wisconsin Society for an Ornithology, both locally and at the need annually. I don't have any scheduled in the near future, but I'm sure I'll have more in the work. I used to lead field trips for the Saxon Bog Winter Birding Festival. Um, unfortunately, that's no longer running, um, but the bog is still very much there, and it is a magical place where you can get the opportunity to definitely go explore there. And I was also the Portage County Coordinator for the Second Wisconsin Breeding Bird Atlas. Big project for five years. And um, it goes to the all the way up to the first one, which is about 20 years ago, to see how our birds have uh, changed. We were expanding the fact that the same 
for that should be published in the next year or so. So stay tuned for that. So we'll go over a brief life history of moths, some benefits for having moths around, cool facts, and we'll showcase some species that occur in Wisconsin, attracting moths, identification, and submitting the observations, and then some species I was documented here. Uh, we'll go see, choose some of those photos, and then questions, which is the part I'm most scared of because I'm just uh, someone who's mildly But here we have some local moths. This is our book kit, uh, painted lichen moth, an American lappet moth. You can see they come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, colors. They're not just those little drab things flying around in the grass that you see or even Pluto in the pantries. <laughs> all kinds of different moths. So all moths start out as eggs. Apologize for having to use a stock image on this. Uh, all of my egg images are very blurry. They're very small. Um, but this one is courtesy of greentime.org. Typically laid on their larval host plant. Uh, when the eggs hatch, the young will feed on it. Um, sometimes in close proximity, I've had moths lay eggs on my life before, which is probably kind of weird, but okay. Um, oh, our best host plant. There's one I have to tell. I'm trying to, uh, online, oh. I can hear you. So we're oh, trying oh. to adjust the mic because okay. the mic is now coming from up here and it's causing issues online. So if you don't mind, we're going to yeah, make it louder or... Sounds good. I am a mumbler, so that's probably beneficial. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, this shows that. Yeah. It does sound better. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, folks. It's going to echo in here and sound oh, better. Speak loud and clear, Rob. I'll try my best. What does that sound? That's <laughs> that's yeah. Sure. Can I just check the chat? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so folks online, we're going to do a little few testing. Can you hear? You can hear me. Of oh, sweet. Because no one ever has a problem hearing me. <laughs> uh -oh. Okay. Do a check I uh, get one. Yeah. Can we hear Ryan? Please. Yeah. Yeah, we know. <laughs> 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 I'm not being offended by this. <laughs> I think okay. it's the wireless mic. Like, I think I can hear better just from just using the. Yeah, maybe Drink more water. Can you can you do a test? Okay, test test. Everybody at home, can you hear better this way? Can you have Rob say jamming on the one? Jamming on the one. <laughs> All right. Yes. Oh, they're saying yes. Yes, yes, yes. They're saying yes. Sweet. Okay. Okay, folks online, thank you for your patience on that. Um, Rob, I'm sorry for the interruption of your oh, no presentation. That's my first one. <laughs> You're awesome. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. doing for science here. Yes, we are. Thank you for adjusting for those online. Two things we've learned about the building tonight. When I first got here, um, so everything's automated. And so it was, the door was locked. And I'm like, oh, what are we going to do now? And I talked to John Munson and I said, see that red bar? That means the building's locked. And, he, and I said, it's supposed to be green. 30 seconds later, he goes, it's green now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, sorry, Rob. Sorry. <laughs> All right, resuming where we were. Can you all hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So I was going to wait to uh, post this one and ask you all what the best pollinator plant was for hosts, but uh, I uh, 
jumped the mouse, I guess, on this one. <laughs> Some 80% of moths use oak trees as a host plant and planting it in your yard, even if it's just scrub oak, can be very beneficial uh, for your local pollinators. And then once the eggs hatch, we get to the larval stage. And here we have a rosy maple moth. Uh, this was at Schmeekly. Um, commonly known as caterpillars. They have five instars or molts. So when they hatch from the eggs, they are very small, uh, but ravenous. They are born with a sense to either eat or grow. So each stage it grows, it molts. And through five instars, <clears throat> at the end of the fifth instar, it finds itself a nice safe place to wrap itself in its next life stage. Um, another caveat to caterpillars is if it has hairs or spines, it might sting. I like to call these notachis um, <laughs> because when I was in Arizona a few months ago, I had one brush the back of my leg and it stung for four or five days. And oh. Zero out of 10 do not recommend. Oh, wow. So next we have the pupa stage. Uh, this is the most common cocoon I see. It's the common bagworm moth. If you look on your siding, uh, park benches, pretty much anywhere, these, this moth is ubiquitous. Funny enough, I've actually never seen the caterpillars or the adult, just the pupa, for whatever reason. I guess they don't come to light. Uh, and in moths, it's known as a cocoon. Um, butterflies, it's a chrysalis. Although I have seen these used interchangeably, um, must be people that like syntactic anarchy. Incubation <laughs> <laughs> for most moths uh, typically lasts a couple weeks up to several months. Some will overwinter. Um, some, in order to hatch, rely on phen phenological or climatic indicators. Uh, so it is best not to disturb a cocoon if you find one. Otherwise, it might not be able to get to the next stage. And then when it is fully developed in the cocoon, it releases hormones, which soften the cocoon, allowing the moth to emerge. Then we have the adult moth, which is the one we're most familiar with. Here's the small-eyed sphinx, one of the most common sphinx moths in our area, I found. Uh, I quite like them. They're very iridescent and pretty. Uh, like I said, they typically eat closed legs first, and then when they're fully emerged, their wings are typically typically crumpled uh, because if they were expanded, they wouldn't be able to fit into the cocoon. Um, so the next several hours after eclosing, they pump liquid into their wings in order to expand them. And before taking flight, they generally have to vibrate their wings. Um, on a daily basis in order to warm up their flight muscles as they spend most of their night on the wing. And we have reproduction. Uh, after emerging, females find a perch in which to broadcast to the male. They secrete a pheromone from their ab abdomen, which the males in turn pick up with their antenna uh, upwards of up to a mile away. <clears throat> Reminds me of a Phil Collins song. The process starts over at the host plant. Now we have the feeding habits of moths. Here you can see they've utilized my bait board pretty well. Um, mostly liquid diet consisting of nectar, uh, fermenting fruit, anything they can sap nutrients from. Uh, if you've ever held a moth or a butterfly on your hand and they stay there for a while, they're actually probably soaking up uh, the salty secretions from our skin, which they get nutrients from. Mm -hmm. They feed using a proboscis, which is a tube-like structure coming out from their face. Um, some moths have adapted some interesting feeding habits. Calyptra, a genus uh, known as vampire moths because they use their proboscis to puncture the skin of large mammals and suck their blood. Hmm. We actually have one of that species in Wisconsin, the Canadian outlet. As far as I know, I don't think they typically feed on people. Um, my buddy Bill would know he's had a couple of his lights and he's yet to be a victim. And then some moths, like our giant silk moths, don't have mouth parts. 
and thus go their entire adult life without feeding, which typically only lasts about seven to 10 days. Um, but their primary focus is on reproduction rather than feeding. If you've ever seen a silk moth larva, they are like sausages, they are very big. So we got some diurnal habits. Uh, during the day, moths will find secretive places to hide, uh, typically in low vegetation, uh, like the Santa type species we have here. Um, a lot of them will go up into the canopy of trees and hide in the leaves. If you've ever watched warblers as they kind of like do that thing with their neck, looking under leaves, they're probably finding some moths. Uh, and if you're out early in the morning, just after sunrise, you can kind of see them flitting around low in vegetation. A few species are active during the day. Um, you can see them nectaring on flowers or just flying around or on the ground like this grapevine epimen epimenus moth. Um, said that. And then we have our camouflage. Moths are awesome at hiding. Um, they blend in with their environment. They've developed an amazing array of patterns. As you can see here, this one blends in very well with the siding where I check the lights. Um, most mimic moss, bark, leaves, and then we have this olive shaded bird dropping moth, which is kind of taking a rather uh, non traditional approach. And then they do find some creative places to hide. As an example, here we have an arched hook tip hiding on the hind quarters of the enemy. Uh, an American toad. Um, I, I think that moth made it. I get a lot of toads. I'm always afraid to step on them at my lights. Now we'll cover some benefits. Um, they're excellent pollinators, especially for night blossoming plants. Uh, does anybody know if we have any native night blossoming plants here? I couldn't exactly find any that were in kind of a point area. Which one? I think the one that I found that was kind of nearest to us was evening primrose. Um, I think some of the primroses only uh, blossom at night, but that one in particular. <clears throat> but they're pretty crucial uh, for pollinating those kinds of plants. They're excellent eco indicators. Uh, the healthier the environment is and the more biodiverse the flora is in that area will result in a greater abundance of both individual moths and diversity uh, wherever you're surveying. And they play a gigantic role in the food chain. Everything from other insects to birds to skunks. Skunks love moths. Uh, I've seen them a couple of times at, at my light setup, which is always a little scary. Um, but even bears uh, eat moths. And then this uh, spruce budworm moth here is actually a huge one for birds. Uh, Tennessee warbler, bay-breasted warbler, and Cape May warblers in breeding season will focus their nesting areas in proximity to outbreaks of this species. So if you're in Northern Wisconsin during Wisconsin Breeding Bird Atlas three. Uh, be on the lookout for this moth because you very well might find the first nest in Tennessee Warbler for, for Wisconsin. We've had a pro couple probables, I uh, just haven't been able to clinch that one quite yet, but they are huge in the ecosystem. Uh, moths also are a great way to connect people with nature. Um, it's just a matter of letting people know. Uh, Iconic species like luna moth, rosy maple moths, any moth that makes you say, ooh, green, um, <laughs> are anything that can spark an interest uh, in anyone and get a passion for nature ignited. Uh, this is the one, the once married underwing that caught my attention about two and a half years ago. It was at the lights. During COVID, I developed this really weird habit of getting up at three in the morning and going bump in the night, I guess. Um, but this one was actually at the lights when I when I was just waking up and it really caught my attention. They're about the size of a monarch uh, and they have a really bright underwing pattern as you can kind of see peeking out there. Uh, another way 
to engage. Um, I remember as a kid raising monarchs and that was pretty memorable. You can do the same thing with like Cecropia moths and other giant silk moths. Uh, kind of gives you kind of a hands-on, more involved um, experience with these pollinators. <clears throat> Next, we'll compare some moths and butterflies. They're both pretty awesome. Moths outnumber butterflies about 10 to 1 diversity. Approximately 2,300 species of moth occur here in Wisconsin versus 153 species of butterfly. 11,000 species of moth in the US versus 750 butterflies. And then worldwide, 160,000 to 180,000 moths. Uh, I couldn't find an exact number. I saw numbers as high as 300,000. Uh, it's probably because moths are so poorly understood and there's a lot of taxonomic stuff that still hasn't been sorted out. And there are about 17,500 butterflies. Um, fun fact, butterflies evolved from moths about 100 million years ago. Uh, so subsequently, all butterflies are technically moths, just kind of a day flying subtype of them, but not all moths are butterflies. If you've ever looked at a list of taxonomic, of, of like the taxonomic tree, butterflies occur smack dab in the middle of moths, and that's exactly why. Uh, how to tell the difference? Moths tend to be more cute, fuzzy, um, and have a variety of different antenna, typically feathered, as opposed to the butterfly, which is, if you've ever seen a butterfly up close, uh, away from the wings, they're actually kind of scary looking. Um, typically, we'll have more elegant wing patterns, hold their wings open, but I don't know if you can see it very well up here, but uh, this pipe vine swallowtail has clubbed antenna. And the best way to separate the two is look at the tips of the antenna because a moth will never have those clubs. Mm -hmm. I think that covers that one. Other facts. Um, moth migration is poorly understood, um, typically because it takes place at night and entomologists just haven't figured out a way to properly study that yet. There is a species in Australia that has been documented migrating up to 1,000 kilometers a year, roughly 600 miles. Uh, of course, there are strays with seasonal weather events and stuff like that, but as a whole, uh, it's poorly understood. Moths typically are more cold resistant than their day flying cousins. Um, I typically see my first moths of the year when temperatures have sustained for about three days at about 55 degrees, lows around freezing or a little above. Uh, and I will see some in the fall, even below freezing, uh, depending on how warm it has been. Showcase some species next. Um, first up, our buck moth complex, which is kind of a taxonomic mess. Entomologists suspect that is likely the Nevada buck moth, uh, based on its association with willows as a host plant. Um, but it also could be eastern buck moth, which is pretty similar. And here we have some range maps. I don't know. This is the Nevada buck moth. You can see it has kind of a checkerboard pattern across the U.S. Uh, and then the eastern buck moth on the right. Furthermore, it may actually be a new species. Uh, we just don't know. The Midwestern fen buck moth might be the culprit here. Um, I had a hard time researching this because all of the papers I used to reference on this are no longer available or I couldn't find them. So maybe it has been updated since and we know what we have here. Um, but as far as I know, it's still a bit of a taxonomic mystery. and. That is the caterpillar. It is very much an Otachi. Um, that was in Dewey, just strolling across the road there. <clears throat> Next one up is a rarity to Wisconsin. It's a tropical species known as the black witch. 
typically annual in Wisconsin, normal range is Central and South America and the kind of subtropical areas of the United States, such as Florida, Texas, Southeast Arizona, um, but an annual rarity to Wisconsin, normally on Southwest winds, uh, has been documented as far North as Canada and Alaska, apologies, um, and has bred as far North as Ohio. It has a seven inch wingspan. So if one's around, you'll probably see it. Uh, this one was actually in Southeast Arizona. Uh, one of the few moths in this presentation that I didn't take here, um, but I was fortunate enough to see one at Patton Center for Hummingbirds. And then some cultures saw it as a symbol of a lost loved one's soul coming back to visit them after they have made it to the great beyond. And then conversely, some cultures saw it as an omen of death. So it's quite the dichotomy. Uh, another pop trivia fact about this species, if you've ever seen Silence of the Lambs, the caterpillars used in that film were of this species. Just another fun fact about that. Now we'll, quick question. Yeah. Are you going to find that moth migrates from South America? Yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. uh, next up, we have the Bruce Spanworm, which is conversely known as one of the winter moths. Uh, they Adults emerge in late October, early November. I've had them flying as late as I think the first week of December. Um, but the, the females and the males come out right around when the lows are in the 30s. So I haven't seen any quite yet, which I take as a good sign that we're still pretty far away from winter. Um, but it's inevitable when I do see them. Uh, the females are flightless. They typically will come up on either sticks or on the trunks of trees and then broadcast the pheromones to the male, which is pictured here, and they find them. Sorry, throw it. All right, attracting moths. Now, before anybody gets on my case about this bug zapper, it used to be a bug zapper. <laughs> I made a friend. Um, first off, you probably need some white canvas of some kind, as we covered, moths are excellent at hiding right in plain sight, but white is one of the best colors that contrasts the majority of moths, so you're going to want either like a shower curtain, siding, a sheet, um, you know, I get them for two or three bucks at Goodwill. Uh, some kind of rope cord or fixture to hang your canvas on. <laughs> pretty easy to figure out. Bait is optional. Um, we'll go over a couple of recipes for that. Typically, I've found bait works best in cooler months when there's less food around. Uh, during the summer, I found that moths don't really come to bait. They are finding food elsewhere, either on flowers or rotten fruit somewhere. Of course, lights. Um, we'll go over lights in a couple slides, but it's one of the most important ones, and not all lights are the same. So we'll go over the specifics of that soon. Uh, a camera, I just use my phone, uh, something to document the mods with, and then a light ring, uh, something to illuminate your subject and get good photos of. I just use this selfie light ring that I bought off of Amazon. As you have seen in previous photos, it works pretty well, um, depending on how cooperative with moth uh, Location, very important. Uh, areas with a lot of plant diversity are the best, like we covered earlier. Uh, this is Herb Martyr Campground in the Chiricahuas of Arizona. This is my mobile setup. The, how do I go back? Uh, the, the previous photo is, is my normal setup where I, where I document all of them in Clover. Um, Ambient light, uh, there's been a study that's come out recently that suggests LED street lights that you've seen around town here. Actually, I think, I don't think those are. Uh, I think I've seen them on Main Street, those LED street lights, you know, how you don't really see insects at them. It's been studied that they kind of disrupt uh, modal organisms that are navigating at light, which is why you really don't see too many of them there. Um, so away from those is good. You're going to want an area that's free of contaminants. 
Uh, there's a lot of con uh, collateral damage when it comes to like spraying for mosquitoes. I get it, they're nuisance, but you're also damaging a lot of other stuff uh, in the process. Naturescaping, big way to promote your local pollinators and also attract moths. Um, anything from goldenrod to joe pieweed to milkweed, it's all good stuff. Uh, and oaks, of course. The climate, that's a big one. Um, this year has been kind of slow for moths since it's been so dry. There's not a lot of blossoming flowers as a result of that. So it's driven numbers uh, to be a bit lower than they were last year. Uh, generally warmer temps will produce the most moths. Anything above 60 degrees uh, is by far the most productive, but they will fly uh, as long as it's before the deep freeze. All right, now on to bait. So we got the classic bait recipe, which is overripe bananas. You know, you forget to make banana bread and you know, you can make moth bait. They don't have to go to waste. Uh, mix that with, it'll be two parts overripe bananas, one part brown sugar. And then I found the secret ingredient, ingredient that adds that extra stink factor is molasses. Uh, it really brings them in, as you can see on the bait board on the right there. Um, you can play around with the recipe. There's no hard coded way to do it. Um, the moths aren't picky. They're, they're going to eat. Our next bait is a wine rope. Uh, you get cheap wine, you know, that $4 bottle from save a lot. That's the one. Uh, <laughs> mix that with some sugar and then simmer it for a minute to get rid of the alcohol and you dip a rope in it and hang it and wait for the moths to come. And that is the only singed pinion I have seen was on one of my wine ropes uh, two years ago. So it, it definitely works. Uh, if the moths are out, they'll come. All right, on to lights. So moths are attracted to light by a concept called phototaxis. It's kind of a binary movement of an organism either towards or away from light. Um, so moths are positively phototactic. Uh, an example of something that's negatively phototactic would either be, you know, like a roach. Uh, and I think there's a pretty good argument to be made that internet trolls are also <laughs> phototactic. The best lights are going to be in between 300 and 400 nanometers uh, for the wavelength. You really don't have to know much other than that. Uh, 365 seems to be the sweet spot, um, but a little less or a little more, it's not going to make a huge difference. As long as it's not LED, uh, it, it should do pretty well. Typically, black and blue lights are the best, um, which would include refactored bug zappers. All you have to do to refactor them is open up the case, Flip the kill wire and cap it with uh, what are they a nickel for those uh, insulation caps? You can find at Lowe's. It's really easy to do, and then you just slap them against the white sheet and you wait. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but there's a lot of stuff on that sheet. Uh, that's this is what summer looks like at, at the lights when it rains, of course. Uh, incandescence halogens and CFLs also do pretty well. Uh, typically above 75 watts, I found, is the best range. Anything lower, it's kind of a poor turnout. And then mercury vapor bulbs, which require either a rather expensive ballast, which has to be installed, or self-ballasted ones are rather expensive, anywhere from $60 to $100. But that is going to be one of your brightest lights, and it's going to be one of the most effective. Uh, I currently don't have one yet, but it's on my list. All right. And then when you do attract moths, you get bonus stuff. Um, here we have a Compton tortoise shell, which was so kindly to use my bait board one fall. I see a lot of spring peepers. And then these things are always super scary when they show up because it sounds like someone's throwing a big lighter at me. Um, <laughs> it's a giant water bug. <clears throat> Did anybody notice the moth in that picture? Blends in. I didn't see it until I took this photo. It's right here. It's uh, I think it's a goat solo. Is he eating it? I don't think so. 
I think it just landed almost on top of it. Uh, and when you attract moths, you could get a, some rarities. <clears throat> um, like I mentioned earlier, moths can flow up on weather systems or with the wind. Uh, this small mochus was one when I saw it, I was pretty excited about because their range is normally south of here. And then the melon worm as well. Uh, that one was actually kind of an event like this, the flamingos. Uh, yeah. For whatever reason, we had sustained south winds that fall and they were showing up. Uh, one showed up in Madison a couple of days and then I got that one. Um, so that was pretty cool. And they have a translucent wings. You, you can see these white streaks are actually, I think, the legs of that moth. And then you have undescribed species, which always, is always a, a fun headache to have. Um, this Yukaz mini species right here, I think there's only one other photo of anything like it online that uh, I could find or one of the people I consult with could find. Um, but it could very well be an undescribed species or just some kind of weird anomaly. And then this one is a spider, not a moth, but it caused some excitement with some arachnophiles on iNaturalist uh, at it, as that pattern was new for the genus. It actually hadn't been documented before and I unknowingly uploaded it to the internet and did some actual science. <laughs> so you never know what you might find. I mean, whenever I check the lights, I'm, a, I'm like a crit on, on Christmas morning. It's, it's always exciting because you never know what treasures that could be there. Uh, into the identification and citizen science um, field guides. I'm kind of old school like that. I like a physical book. Um, not only does it give you a good starting reference, but it also will cover like um, esoteric jargon, like uh, anatomical terms that like, if you look on bug guide or something like that, like what the heck is a costa? Um, but it'll give you that kind of information. iNaturalist and LEPS are two apps which use AI to run your photos against their databases and suggest AIs that have, or uh, based on observations that have been in that area. Um, do not default to use that ID. Always cross-reference AI, unless you for sure know it. Generally, they're pretty accurate, but uh, mods are so granular where you have to kind of cross-reference stuff. Um, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. iNaturalist is another great one because you can upload your photos there at kind of a, a lower level, such as genus or family, and other people can look at it and suggest what they think. Uh, it's a great place to get your observations peer reviewed. Uh, some other really good resources here are Bug Guide, definitely not the most user-friendly site, but a whole lot of information on there. Um, you can also upload photos there. It's under this ID request, uh, this photo right here. Um, and generally people there are super knowledgeable. Uh, just follow the protocol, otherwise they will tell you to. <laughs> moth Photographers Group is a place where you can kind of filter moth photos by state. Uh, it's a great place to scroll through and kind of get a visual reference on a lot of things. And then Butterflies and Moths of North America, kind of similar to Bug Guide and iNaturalist. Um, you can upload photos there. Uh, some pretty good range maps. Uh, I think we only have one or two regional reviewers who uh, review records on that site. So I definitely try to mitigate what I post there as to not overwhelm them because I've taken 30,000 photos of moths and I could easily do that. <laughs> uh, don't use Google Lens ever. For IDs, uh, please. It's probably the most inaccurate um, AI ID out there, even for birds. Like I've seen some pretty, some pretty bad ones. There's also social media forums, um, Facebook groups. There's a couple of those. I generally don't even have to post there. Uh, I just type in like either the genus or the family that I'm looking for, and someone has generally had the same problem I have, uh, and there's been a pretty good discussion. Um, I think there's some of that on Bug Guide as well. My friend Dave Whitrock uh, 
fellow moth enthusiast, has compiled a fantastic moth checklist, which includes a lot of the host plants, the regions the moths occur. Uh, it, it, he's pulled in observations from everything before this and compiled them into one database. So every species is there. And if anyone is interested, I can email it to you. It's just I brought a, a notebook. So if you're interested in seeing that, I can definitely send that. And then Moth Week events, another thing to um, get people engaged, observing stuff. Um, it was mentioned at the last week's board meeting that we might be doing something next year. Uh, over at Schmeekly or something for Moth Week. So sure. something to stay tuned for. Go over some identification tips. Um, moth IDs can be extremely granular. Um, uh, like I said earlier, always cross-reference several resources. I found even then I'm still wrong. Uh, and even after being peer reviewed, it can still be wrong. Uh, that's just the way of moths. Um, but one benefit of that is it makes you pay attention to detail uh, in much, uh, much um, a more attentive way. Uh, some moths can only be separated by antenna structure. So we have this Feltia, this is Feltia tricosa. These are two different. I should have looked at this before I uploaded it, but the way to separate, this is Feltia tricosa. And this is Feltia subgothica. And the way to separate them is by looking at how the antenna is shaped uh, right there. And I, I don't remember how it is on this one, but I know that's how uh, I separated the two. <clears throat> so getting really clear photos uh, from multiple angles is the way to go. Uh, some can only be identified from the patterns underneath, like this Desmia complex. Um, I believe this is Desmia maculalis, yep. Uh, Desmia funeralis will be entirely white underneath as opposed to kind of a broken pattern like that. So generally when I find out stuff like this, it's in hindsight and I have to make note of it for future reference. So it's a constantly process of learning. Some moths can only be separated by a wing length measurement or a wing span measurement. So always keep a ruler handy. <clears throat> And further complicating things as moths age, they tend to lose scales and kind of look really beat up because they like flying into things, uh, which can muddy field marks and make them actually look uh, blank and drab. And it can get really confusing. And those are best left un id <laughs> Then we have some advanced IDs. Um, a lot of complexes which require either dissection, as we see in this sadder euphysia. Uh, euphysia is the largest genus with a lot of undescribed species. Uh, I had this one sent to a lady in, I think, Vermont, who specializes in this species, and that is... Um, under the microscope, how she identified it to species. And whenever you have something ID'd like this, generally it's very few data points on the map. Uh, not everybody takes this approach. And it really doesn't impact the population. It's a total normal thing in entomology. I was kind of a little off put when I first discovered that it was a thing, but I guess it's totally normal. Um, gen uh, Further muddying the waters is species that need DNA barcoding, um, like this coleophora here, which I guess is extremely inaccurate, only accurate about 30% of the time. So these, uh, this particular genus, the case bearers or coleophora is best left there rather than going through that headache. Um, but this is also true with a lot of the micromoths. Uh, a lot of the micromoths also need dissection. Next, species gallery. We got the glorious habrazine, <clears throat> pine side crambid moth, straight line baxi. This one's always one of my favorites. And then we have some of the ooh green ones. <laughs> we have blackberry looper moth, wavy lined emerald, 
and the scribbler. This one's my favorite. Sure, the gasp uh, when I first saw one. <laughs> so we have silver spotted ghost moth, which <clears throat> I guess really doesn't come to lights too often. So I was pretty stoked to see one of those this year. Uh, double tooth prominent or the prominent moths. These typically are bigger. Atlantis webworm. Um, this species kind of concerns me that it's around, not in itself is it destructive, um, but it's host plant, uh, Ilanthus. Uh, if you've been following spotted lantern flies, their host plant is also Ilanthus. Mm -hmm. And they've been reported in Chicago as of this year. So I think it's imminent that they will follow soon. Um, and then we have kind of one of the more unusually shaped ones here, dark Marathissa, silver spotted fern moth, parthenice tiger moth, <clears throat> this genus Apentesis. Um, a lot of them look like this, and you need to get photos of the underwing pattern to separate them because a lot of them look like this above. Unspotted looper, this is always a funky shaped one that I really like. Hologram moth, one of my favorites. It's, it's shiny. Uh, this gold pattern right here is iridescent and shimmers in the light. The concept loa, very variable. Like sometimes they have entirely white all the way down here in the wing. And it's just these like two <laughs> black lines going down. And sometimes uh, haploas can, as they age, lose all of this black uh, coloring in their wings and be unidentifiable, which is always fun. Here's one of the prettiest bird dropping moths, owl-eyed bird dropping moth, and then small magpie, which is one of the moths that looks more like a butterfly. We have the German cousin. Um, this one was one of those that it was peer reviewed and still wrong and then peer reviewed again. Um, I, from what I'm told, this one is rarely seen in the Midwest and the guy who I did it was pretty excited that uh, I posted the photo of it. Um, but I guess they're pretty rare here, more of an Eastern species, I think. Yellow collared skate moth. I see these sometimes in the day, rosy maple moth. And then we have on the smaller end, a birch ermel. Uh, these are only a couple millimeters long. They are very small. And then I will open it up to questions after introducing the black zale and the polyphemus moth. <laughs> Yes, when you talk about the book, buck moth complex before, um, I've never identified those fall just probably three weeks ago on, yeah, yeah. on the boardwalk by nice. uh, Moses Creek. They were cool. doing some behavioral things, but then I was then doing some digging and I wondered how would how would they determine if it is the uh, is it the pen or oh, the Midwestern? Midwestern? I would imagine DNA barcoding. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. probably why it's taken so long. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it was just interesting because it really, it really, uh, the they behavior did. was, was yeah. crazy because they were doing some quivering and some, I don't know if they were. Oh, if it was quivering, it's probably warming up its flight muscles. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. They were sitting on, they were sitting yeah. on the boardwalk. Yeah, we see them vibrating their wings. Yeah, yeah. It's like that. Yeah, they're warming up their flight muscles. Well, so the other one is very bright red. Color. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're gorgeous. I haven't seen an adult yet, but it's on my list. Yeah. Um, Overwintering as adults, how many moths do that? Quite a few actually, and they typically do it under bark or um, in, in any sheltered area. Uh, but yeah, I, I know quite a few will. Um, exact numbers, I could anyone's guess. Yeah. There's a question online about protocol for using lights to capture. Does it disrupt at all their well, light that's cycle? That's a good question. So it doesn't really disrupt it as long as you're doing it kind of as you're looking. Um, but it's also important to kind of turn them off before the sun rises because birds will definitely take advantage of your sheets. <laughs> I have a house friend that that um, roosts in the clothesline where, where I hang my sheet on. So it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's cardinals too, they love them. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 Does it damage the moth to handle it when the scales come off the wing? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I generally don't touch them. 
uh, unless I'm collecting a specimen. And even then that's not very often, maybe one or two a year. Um, yeah, yeah, they, they like butterflies, their wings are, are pretty fragile and <clears throat> uh, handling will brush the scales off. Yeah. So Rob, you say a lot of the communication is done with pheromones, yeah. right? They're nocturnal. Mm -hmm. um, why bother with all these different color patterns and um, scale patterns if it doesn't? Uh, a lot of it is for the camouflage, but uh, as far as the intricate patterns, I don't know. It's maybe like a defense mechanism, like I'm poisonous if you eat me or something like that. Um, otherwise, I don't know. It's anyone's guess. Yeah. Just a comment on that. Some of that color patterns in the adult might come from the color patterns in the caterpillar mm -hmm. that is around in the daylight and needs different um, mechanisms for defense. Okay. Cool. What else? Yeah. So where do you send a, a moth if you want the DNA analysis? <laughs> Who um, does that? Yeah, there's one lady in Vermont that I, I've sent to. Uh, also, there was one moth I did send to the UW lab down in Madison, but I didn't get any nice photos of what they took photos of to ID it. So like I could stop sending them there. Mm -hmm. um, eventually I'd like to get into it, uh, but microscopes are expensive. <laughs> well, yeah. Your pictures are really good. And you said you use your cell phone. I tried to take a picture of a moth, my cell phone and didn't look like that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just, I just have an iPhone. Um, you have to have like the three lens on the back. Yeah, yeah. that helped. I with Some of these are actually with my old, old phone, which I didn't have uh, at the time. Uh, let's see if I can bring them up. But generally when they're on the sheet, they really don't fly too far away and I could just get right up to them. And, and yeah, mine nice was photos. in my house, like on my wall. And I was like this, it doesn't yeah. come out. <laughs> I mean, but, but uh, I think the light. Yeah, yeah. it's the I light. It, de it, it definitely makes it pop because yeah. I've tried using a flashlight when either this is dead or I've lost it, mm -hmm. and it, it is a really real challenge okay. for sure. Mm. Well, yeah. Is there an advantage for them in terms of being attracted to light? I'm not sure. sure. I think they do navigate by the moonlight uh, for feeding and stuff. I, I have noticed on nights where it's a full moon, activity is way down. So mm -hmm. darker nights, more moths, lighter nights, less moths. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There was one other question from a Zoom listener, and that was, if they raised moths in a monarch house, would they limit it to a single species? I don't know for sure, but I don't think it would be a problem as long as the caterpillars don't eat each other. Just keep them fed. <laughs> I mean, I would imagine you could do it. Yeah. So if you had a butterfly garden, would that attract moths as Absolutely, well? Absolutely, 100%. Same plants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you look there at, at night, you'll see them uh, nectaring on the flowers. I, there's this guy, I think he's from Rhode Island, who often will check fields of goldenrod and he'll get like a hundred species in a night. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you all for listening to me talk about my Really appreciate it. Uh, I think they're really neat. And I hope I helps uh, spread a little more appreciation for them. Um, yeah. Actually, just thought of one. Are moths experiencing the same uh, levels of decline that? Uh, yeah, it's are. ubiquitous among all insects, unfortunately. Yeah. It's, uh, birds do. It, it's it, if you can help them out in any way, do it. Anything else?